we made phenomenal progress in the last 25 years when Bernard Jones was teaching me cosmology. Uh, in the sense that we have climbed the tower, we're at the top of the tower of cosmology, like in this uh, drawing, and we have a fairly good model that describes every single observation in the sky with just seven parameters. Now, despite the fact that we have this model, we have uh, actually almost zero knowledge about the physical content on the universe. It is usually said that we don't know what the dark matter is, that's true. We don't know what the dark energy is, that's true. But also, actually, we don't know how to put baryons in the universe because there should be only photons. That's what our equations tell us, that they should be. So actually, it's actually most of the matter content, besides photons and neutrinos, that it is not un understood. So during the, since I'm going to be here for the whole period of this uh, workshop, I mean, during the three months, I will talk about this, the left part of this uh, view graph at the seminar, at the regular seminar during the, during the period. What I want to do today is to focus on the origin of the early universe and what we know about it and how we can learn something else about that origin. So as I said, for me the picture is like this. We climb the tower, but we seem to be going around in circles. Not very clear where we should go from there. So I'm going to try to bring some modest view on to where we should go and how we should proceed to try to get out of the, of the infinite loop. So I think it's worth reminding that we have a pretty good paradigm to describe the early universe. It's called inflation. And this paradigm has passed uh, four major tests during these uh, past years, which is the fact that we have seen super horizon perturbations, so that's the anticorrelation of the T and E. We know that the power spectrum of this fluctuation is nearly a scale invariant, but not quite, and actually deviates exactly as uh, we were expecting it to deviate from extremely simple models of inflation. The universe is, special, is, is essentially flat and isotropic, and that we have seen from the, we have proved symmetry from the CMB. And we know that the initial conditions are very nearly Gaussian. In fact, we only have an upper limit to that. But there are a few things that we have not yet measured or seen. We have not seen any proof of a period of accelerated expansion, and that's what is going to be the, the tensor modes. We haven't seen yet the tiny deviation from Gaussianity that we should see. And by tiny here, I'm going to mean a very tiny number, which we'll see in a bit. And one other important thing that I want to emphasize, which is usually like, uh, you know, swept under the, under, the, under the rack, is that we have not demonstrated homogeneity. We have assumed it to be at the Copernican principle. That's an assumption that says that we are not in a special place, but that's an assumption. We have not measured that. And I want to emphasize, before I go into the core of this study, two things that we did. One was a way to actually measure homogeneity from the fossil record. To measure homogeneity, you have to look inside the past light cone, not on the surface, as you do with the CMB. And that's something that you can do, actually, with the fossil record of galaxies, because these things have been sitting inside the past light cone for quite uh, for the Hubble time. So if you do that, you can actually constrain homogeneity to better than 94% at 2 sigma. And another thing that now has been opened up as a possibility is that you can actually measure curvature independently of the model, because from Planck you have amazing constraints on curvature, but that's a model-dependent statement. That basically assumes the lambda CDM and tells you what omega k should be. But actually using this extremely simple equation, you can use the gravitational waves to measure DL, and the Hubble parameter can be measured from different things, like the cosmic clocks. And you can actually put constraints from very futuristic surveys on curvature of the order of 10 to the 5, 10 to the minus 5. That should be the, inflation, the inflationary prediction. So if you measure something at that level or above, you are testing the inflationary paradigm without having to look at the tensor modes, because those are the fluctuations that you should be seeing. But let me go back to the main theme of this talk, which is what I want to address, which is the energy scale of inflation. The energy scale of inflation for single field inflation is given by this uh, extremely simple formula, which is uh, derived down here, if you want to spend your time on that, and basically tells you that you can express the height of the potential of, of the inflaton 
through this parameter called R. Now, the best way to try to measure that is to look at the CMB polarization, because then you have there a quadrupole that it is generating polarization in the potential wells, and then you get at the last scattering surface this pattern that it is what everybody is trying to see. And in fact, we do that, and we have pretty good constraints on that. This is the latest uh, Planck uh, 2018 constraint. So up here I put R. Remember that R is like the scale of inflation to the quarter. And here is plotted again the tilt of the primordial power spectrum. So if you, take all the, if you are willing to take all the experiments here, you have constraints of about 0.1. And already you can say that the inflaton potential was not like this. It's actually like this. So the constraints are very good. Now, we did, uh, we did uh, predict uh, back in 2005 how this experiment should be progressing depending on how, much, uh, how many detectors you are willing to put on your focal plane and how good you can be at removing foregrounds. And we are just walking all the way through here. But there's one thing I want to emphasize of this plot. If you remember this equation, right? We're already putting constraints at the order of 0 0.1. And the best we're going to be able to do realistically is 10 to the minus 3. That's a factor of 100. That's only a factor of 3 in energy scale. So either the God was kind enough to us to put the energy scale of inflation a factor of 3 below what it is currently now. And you can think about coincidences. Or really, we're going to have a hard time uh, finding the inflaton via this way. You may argue why the inflaton scale is so fine-tuned to be 10 to the 15 to be discovered in 2030 and not in 2005. I remind you here that the original bicep claim was up here now excluded to many, many, many sigmas in this scale. And the other thing I also like to remind you is that unfortunately we have no predictions where uh, the model should be here. You can, basically, if you ask a theoretician, they can give you any point here in this plane they want. It is fairly trivial to move anywhere you like. The only firm constraint is that the scale has to be bigger than MEVs because you want to produce, you, do, you want to do nucleosynthesis at the end of the day. Actually, it's not even leptogenesis, it's just nucleosynthesis. So this scale is actually not GEVs, but MEVs. And MEV in this plot is actually down at the bottom in the basement. So this is the perspective, and this is the way we are. And always when you talk about inflation, I cannot stop but uh, showing this uh, puzzle, which I call coincidences. So imagine you wake up in the morning, and you go to the countertop to make coffee, and you find there is only one grain, the one bean of coffee there at the edge of the countertop. The question is, where is the rest of the bag? <laughs> Any takers? Well, the most likely thing is actually on the floor, right? <laughs> that should be the most. Uh, and yes, I'm talking about landscape and all these things. That might, uh, unless you believe somebody went there in the night, your kid, and put the bean exactly at the edge of the countertop for you to see it in the morning. But yes, I'm talking about the landscape and all these things, something that would be nice actually to check. And, uh, and we have some ideas about that, but I'm not going to enter into that. I just wanted to mention it that every time you're talking about this inflation, the landscape problem appears. And I think there are some ideas about how to check that. So what I'm going to do now is to actually focus on a different way to check for the early universe and to try to learn something about, uh, about inflation, which is to look for the non-Gaussianities in the early universe. So if you look at the bias spectrum of the three-point function in real space, it has some information on the early universe physics. So basically, you can look at the different shapes of this bias spectrum, and they are telling you things about the initial state of the inflaton or the universe. So the local shape, the one that it is uh, squeezed, gives you information on gravitational growth. The equilateral shape, and this will be, uh, I guess I ran out of a pointer. The equilateral shape. Uh, give information about the inflaton self-interaction, while the so-called folded shape 
tells you information on the initial state of the inflaton. People have been working a lot about these kind of uh, features and non-Gaussianity. There's an enormous literature going on about that, especially about the bispectrum. And I will mention that uh, there are some predictions that you can make for this kind of non-Gaussianities. Now, I want to emphasize one point here, which is that uh, it's somehow like real non-Gaussianity and fake non-Gaussianity, in the sense that if you have two fields, it is very easy to actually produce a non-Gaussianity that it is observable. But in the single field case, there is a current debate of whether or not this non-Gaussianity that it is dependent of the slow roll parameters is detectable, observable or not, right? I think everybody agrees that at least the one coming from the collateral shape from the epsilon is detectable. The question is if the one coming from the eta is detectable or not. And I will discuss that at the end of my talk and show some ideas. But instead of looking at the bias spectrum, I'm going to look at something else. And uh, the motivation is the following. So there has been in the last few years this debate about whether or not if you have a single field, which is a single clock, this non-Gaussianity that the inflaton is going to generate between you know, the coupling of the inflaton fluctuations and the, and the curvature uh, is going to be detectable or not. So one idea was to say, OK, let's try to look at the physical effect instead. Because if these projection effects are going to be gauged away, then it's maybe interesting to look at the physical effect that is taking place. So one physical effect that happens is the graviton exchange. The graviton exchange is nothing else than the graviton that is being exchanged at horizon crossing between four scalar fluctuations. Okay? And that is going into the tri spectrum, and this is what non Gaussianity does to you. It just generates non trivial endpoint functions. So what I'm going to do, what we did, is actually to look at this graviton exchange and see if it was possible to actually measure this process from the large scale structures. So how do you do that? Well, recall that uh, the non-Gaussian signal generated by curvature perturbations is passed to the matter perturbation, right? So remember the muhano sasaki variable, and then you have these corrections that are sending you there. Now, there's another trick that you should play, because, of course, the tri spectrum is there are actually two things that are important in this game that I think it will be inter interesting to emphasize. One is the expectation that these effects are extremely tiny, that they are going to be suppressed by epsilon, slow roll parameter orders, high orders, right, like square. Third, right. Well, that doesn't happen for the graviton exchange, and I will show you why. And the second thing is that there is another trick to actually measure this signal, which is the boosting by looking at the dark matter halos. And uh, this non-Gaussian halo bias is something that people have been playing a lot in the past. But basically, this is the idea that happens here. Let me just recall how this thing works. And this is a very simple uh, peak theory when you look at the high at the correlation of the high excursion regions, what you find is that uh, if you look at the power spectrum of the correlation of the halos, of the high peak halos, basically you see that there is an enhancement due to any by spectrum. You want to put the local case, but in reality, any by spectrum that you can think of is going to take this power spectrum of the non Gaussianity and generate a scale dependent bias that is going to push you up all the way up. So basically, from the naive expectation that this effect is going to be a small, then you get to a point where you input the trispectrum contribution, which is the one that I was going to see from this graviton exchange. And then the hope is that you are going to see a signal here that it is detectable. Or at least you can do the calculation and see if that signal is big or not. So as you see, the process is, uh, if you wish, somehow simple or straightforward. The only thing you have to do is to take this point, four point function or, or the tri spectrum, the connected part. You write it down, all these terms. 
you look at the part that it is given by the graviton exchange. So the graviton exchange, as I write here, is not suppressed by high powers of the slow roll parameter of the epsilon, which is the one that counts for all this gain, right? And it is because of this simple explanation and this simple Feynman diagram. It is basically, you have like a, a still dependencies of R or epsilon when you have this interaction with the four legs of the, of the exchange, right? So you can do two things. You can just go and look in the map for the tri-spectrum directly. So you start to do uh, shapes, parallelograms, right? And start to try to look for that signal. But that's like a pretty, pretty enormous. Or you can actually look, as I said, through the, through the effect of the tri-spectrum input into the, into the power spectrum and see if that signal is going to be boosted or not. So basically, what you want to do is to calculate this four point function here, which is given by this expression, which are just basically different combination of the shapes and the angles. So let me go to Fourier space. So I Fourier transform that uh, expression up there. And then what I really have to do is to compute this equation here. So the non-Gaussian uh, power spectrum will be given by the Gaussian one, which is given by the standard formula plus all these contributions that are right here from the bispectrum and the trispectrum in, in, the, in the different terms. So that's a fairly well-defined problem. You just do these integrals. Now, these integrals are gigantic, gigantic because they are multidimensional, right? So, so, so if you ask somebody to say, OK, let me do this thing for general shapes, general shapes, I mean combinations of the four vectors in any angle or module is going to be impossible. So you have to start to do the calculations with some, some shapes. So the most uh, dominant ones are going to be these parallelogram shapes that I show here. And I'm showing this picture because there's a warning that you should be careful about because otherwise you are going to get into the same uh, problems as uh, or the current debate that is going on about what is happening with the bispectrum and the local shapes. So basically, the argument by people, uh, like Fabian has been leading this work, is that uh, if you have highly squeezed uh, modes that are outside the horizon, they can be incorporated into the curvature, and you are not going to see them. Right? Now, you look at shapes like this, these shapes, these uh, super squeezed shapes that are also coplanar are going to have two vectors that are going to sum to zero. And in fact, these shapes are dual to actually something that is local. The same way you have a, a square here, you can basically, by duality, just make it super flat. So those shapes are bad. We don't want them. Not because we don't like them or not. We are not trying to enter into the debate. Basically, because these are shapes that can be subject to a gauging or a gauging process, or redshift it away. So we are not going to consider those. The only ones we are going to consider are the ones that are sort of equilateral ones, right? And those are the ones that are actually living at inside the horizon, and therefore it is a physical process. So what Nicola did was smartly take this integral and exponentially suppress all these shapes that are going to be something like this. So in principle, this calculation that I'm going to show to you doesn't have any of these ultra squeeze or squeeze shapes that can have these kind of problems. So after you do the, of course, after means a lot of work. You do these integrals and you actually check this thing. This is the result of the, of the calculation, which is actually quite interesting. So. This is the signal in the halo power spectrum. And what I'm showing here on the y-axis is the ratio between different bias spectra on the left and the graviton exchange contribution on the right for the, for the ratio of the non-Gaussian to the Gaussian power spectrum, OK, at redshift equals 0. So basically, when it says 1, it means that it is the non-Gaussian contribution is equal to the Gaussian term, OK? So if you look on the left here, what you have 
uh, uh, in blue is the original uh, bispectrum. So remember, on the left, I'm talking about bispectrum. On the right, I'm talking about the. This is the contribution of the bispectrum to the power spectrum of the halos. This is the contribution of the trispectrum via graviton exchange to the power spectrum of the halos. So on the left, what you have is the original Malda Sena term. And this term has been disputed to be so high. So what people have done, uh, so we show here the work by Cabas, uh, Fabian, and Pager, is that actually it is not that high when you do calculations and you do the, 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 the corrections, what you find is that this term is actually much, much lower, right? Now, to be frank, there is a debate open about this. So just take either side you like. I'm not going to enter into this debate. For me, it's much better if it is smaller because this bothers me, right? You are going to see that this is the same amplitude of, the, of, of our new term. So in, fa in fact, to me, this is a contaminant. So the lower the contaminants, the better, right? And then I'm showing you some. I filter out the squeeze shape, that's the one, but I'm talking about the... But not the, on the left, or? Not on the left I did. So on the left I took your result. This is the, 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 the orange line is your result from your paper. But in the blue, do you put... No, the blue is a straight Maldacena. That's like if you believe that you didn't filter out the straight, sh the, the folded shape, right? The, the blue would be a straight Maldacena. It would be like if you were able to observe this kind of non-Gaussianity, right? So that's what I'm saying, that uh, 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 this is the, the, the result from your paper where you filter out. Or not, not you don't filter out, you actually look at what you did in your paper, look at the corrections right. that are going to give you some residual result, right? So if you, if you believe that you can, this Maldacena term is not real, it is just a gauge artifact, then you should look only at lines at this level. Okay. Now on the right, on the green line or yellow line, depending on your eyesight, what you see is the result of the graviton exchange on the power spectrum. And then you see that this term is quite significant. Here I have filtered out all the squeeze shapes. So this one only has equilateral shapes. So the nice thing to, to our uh, surprise was that actually this term comes back to be at a significant level when you measure the power spectrum. To me, everything on the left is a contaminant, okay? Because all these shapes are going to be added to each other. So the smaller the things are here, the better for me. The signal should be something like that. And also the signal has a very definitive uh, scale dependent, right? So this is something that you can check with future surveys if this signal is actually of this shape or not. If I remember correctly, it goes like k to the minus 6 or something like that. So the graphon exchange is model independent? Say that again. The graphon exchange is model independent? The graph on the right? Or or three, there's no three, three parameters. Like which ones? Uh, uh, Besides assuming... It's a single field okay. where you are just looking at this four-leg interaction. That's all, that's all that we have. And then we restrict ourselves to equilateral type uh, shapes. So that's the only, that's the only. Uh, What's the R you assume here? Uh, the R was like 0 0.01 or 0 0.1. No, no, the R. Uh, 0 0.1. 0 0.1, the current limit. Yeah, so this, of course, this scales, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is, this is uh, let me uh, emphasize this, yeah, that's a good point, thank you. So this is assuming an R, right? So that's the free parameter maybe you are talking about, that Dan is talking about. So R is 0.1, right? Of course, if R was to be 10 to the minus 3, this thing scales down by the, I'm not claiming that I can see R 10 to the minus 10. This is going to scale the same way as the, as the, as the epsilon, right, as the slow roll. So these things are going to go, if R is a small, uh, this thing is going to go down to these levels very quickly, right? So, so this is for, uh, I mean, both ones are for R equal 0 0.1. Now, uh, we also did the calculation on the, on the, on the, 
on the bispectrum part. I'm not going to dwell on that. This is like uh, more for uh, aficionados. But just to tell you that, that also there you can look at uh, how these things scale and thus that how this effect is, is going on. So you see, it was good to you. I only took uh, 30 minutes to get to most of my talk. So, um, but let me just say, so since I have time, I can talk a bit about uh, the results. Um, I, I think it's very crucial that we try to understand what is the engine behind the early universe. Uh, otherwise, we are going to be uh, at a loss of uh, knowing what is happening uh, at the beginning of the universe. Um, one idea which I think is a very nice window into the early universe is looking at the non-Gaussianities which are being produced during inflation because, because of this coupling of the curvature and the field. One thing we did here was to look at the graviton exchange. And the motivation for that was simply that since there has been this debate about the fact that maybe that many of these effects are just simple, simple projection effects, it would be nice to look at some physical effect that is actually taking place. And our idea was to see if we could actually look at the clustering of dark matter halos and see the effect of gravitons being exchanged between the scalar fluctuations during the early universe. And what we found is that, in fact, it looks like you can actually see it, that the signal is not completely uh, negligible and then maybe there is some hope for uh, the rare peaks to actually tell us something about the early universe. So basically, by looking at the clustering of these uh, rare peaks, you can learn about the physics that happened in the early universe. So my hope is that maybe in a few years, when we do this exercise from the last galaxy surveys, I can modify the Escher plot and get to something, to a big disruption, so I can get to know what is happening in the early universe by looking at these gravitons. So since I have time, plenty of time, I will leave you with an ad. We have plenty of postdoctoral positions in our uh, lab. And further, there are also senior, although they're called junior, but uh, senior, uh, senior uh, positions and uh, you can talk to Hector, who is sitting over there, who is taking one of these positions, actually, in October and coming to join us. But also, I wanted to say that, uh, that we are looking for a lot of postdocs in Barcelona. So I'll leave the conclusions up here, and I'm willing to actually, actually, I'm going to do something better. I'll leave the plot, which I think is the most interesting result, and I'll take questions. Thank you.